Chapter 4, The Four-Way A few months after Hunter's 10th birthday in 1979, Hunter Sr. was living alone in a Memphis suburb. His place was modest but comfortable. He missed his son, but he found it was easier to bury himself in his work than to deal with his ex-wife's incessant demands. She hadn't managed to totally poison his son against him, but he figured it was only a matter of time. He'd been seeing a much younger but very nice court reporter on a casual basis, but their relationship had ended badly after Karen was confronted in the hallway outside the courtroom one day. Belle had come screeching at her, all flying hair and long nails seeming to appear out of nowhere. Whore! Whore! Belle had screamed at Karen, just a few inches from her face before the bailiffs had appeared to drag her out of the courthouse. Karen had been hysterical afterwards, and he had been pretty disturbed by the incident himself. The entire episode had been unnerving and completely humiliating. But on another level, that he didn't like to admit to himself, terrifying. What if she had a gun? He hadn't witnessed the episode until the end when the bailiffs were ejecting her from the courthouse. He felt lucky that Belle hadn't seen him as he exited the men's room after hearing the commotion. He didn't know how she would have reacted then. He also didn't like to admit that he was becoming afraid of her. He talked to Karen and calmed her down somewhat, but two days later, her new Ford Pinto was found vandalized in the parking lot across from the courthouse after work. All of the windows had been broken and the word whore was spray painted across both sides in bright red paint. The parking attendant had been on a break, but two witnesses came forward to say that they saw a tall black man accompanied by a shorter, obese man walking away from the parking lot at a pace just short of a run shortly before the Pinto was discovered vandalized. That same evening, as he drove Karen home after she dropped her car off at the Crutchfield dealership, he noticed a dark, early 60s Chevy Nova following them through town. It was too dark to see the color, but there were several dents, including a crease on the hood. Despite making several unnecessary and unannounced turns, the Chevy continued to trail them all the way to her apartment. Hunter didn't want to say anything to alarm her, but as she leaned over to kiss his cheek, he reached into his coat pocket to find the 38 Special that he had recently purchased. He absolutely noted that the kiss was dry, dutiful, and devoid of any passion as he watched the rearview mirror. As she got out, he carefully watched the other car, but the occupants roared off as they watched her climb the stairwell unaccompanied. He made sure Karen was in her apartment safely before he drove to a nearby gas station to find a payphone to call in a few favors. He didn't want to involve the police. As an attorney, he knew he didn't have any proof, only suspicions. Suspicions wouldn't get him anywhere. But Marcus, a recent client of his, could watch the apartment overnight to make sure no one came back. Tommy, one of the slightly shady private investigators that he used frequently, could help him do some digging. Meanwhile, his relationship with Karen was obviously over. That kiss on the cheek had been more arctic than anything else. He couldn't blame her. They only had been dating a short while. A casual relationship like theirs, for all the joy it had brought him, couldn't survive such a vicious onslaught. The next day, he met with Tommy and one of his new clients. They met at the four-way restaurant, which was one of his favorite places to conduct business or fill out a new client. 
Since he had gone out on his own as a criminal defense attorney, he had to make some accommodations for his shoestring practice. He no longer had the resources of the larger firm and his tiny office didn't attract big money or celebrity clients. In fact, with the caseload that included his public defender clients, he had to be careful not to be drawn into the crosshairs of the rival gangs and organized crime that operated within the city. Also, his involvement in several notable civil rights cases had attracted another sort of unwanted attention from the likes of people that considered James Earl Ray to be a national hero. When living in the city, containing a statue that served as the final resting place for Nathan Bedford Forrest, you could be sure that the Klan had a strong presence here. But the down-home atmosphere in a predominantly black neighborhood put the majority of clients at ease. Irene Cleves, who ran the restaurant, was a friendly and familiar face. She also had a keen instinct for people, and so did her staff. If the folks at the four-way didn't want to let one of his clients in after they rang the doorbell, they meant they were trouble. That was about all the screening Hunter needed. For Hunter, the four-way was also a place where he could get the home-cooked meals that he couldn't get at home. These comfort foods that had been part of his life since he was eight years old, reminded him of cherished memories. It brought back weekends at Uncle Beauregard's workshop, sanding woods for sailboats. Spending the day surrounded by the comfort of repetition and the smell of wood, stain, and varnish. Miss Ruby would bring in lunch trays filled with homemade fried chicken, black-eyed peas, mashed potatoes, and cornbread. Sometimes Miss Ruby would add a little slice of whatever leftover dessert she'd made earlier that week. His favorite was her peach cobbler. Miss Ruby had retired in 1960 and died a few years later, but he always remembered her fondly. She'd been kind to a lost little boy who had felt out of place. The food at the four-way brought back all those memories, one bite at a time. Today, after eating and enjoying every last crumb of Miss Cleve's cobbler, he waited for the client to leave. Then, instead of the usual post-appointment discussion with Tommy, he brought up the topic of bail. He filled in some more of the details from his brief phone call the night before. I hate to say it, Tommy. I really do. I was married to that woman for a long time. But these days, I feel like I don't know her at all. I just don't know what she's capable of. And I am worried for both Karen and my son's safety. Tommy nodded and listened as he continued. I'm hoping some of this will cool off once Belle realizes that I'm not seeing Karen anymore but I'm very worried about what this kind of behavior is doing to my son. It must be affecting him. I have a hard time believing that she isn't acting like this in front of him. He paused and then continued. And the worst part is, I don't know how much of this is an act or if she's really becoming unhinged. I hate to say it, but she's just so manipulative that I just can't tell. The best thing that ever happened to me was the day she stormed out. Tommy nodded empathetically and agreed to investigate Belle and her two assistants. Hunter, you have that gun, right? I sure hope I don't have to use it, Hunter replied. They paid the check and left the restaurant together. A few weeks later, Belle began calling him frequently. At first, she used the pretext of their son, but when he started sending a friend over to pick up Hunter directly from school to avoid any contact with Belle, she changed her tactics. Instead, 
she began calling several times a day, going on the charm offensive. Her calls were full of her lilting, languid drawl, and soft laughter. Why, Hunter, really? She said all cozy and familiar in a recent call. He would gently and politely find ways to get off the phone, so then she started stopping by. He had to admit that he enjoyed seeing all the effort she was making, but there was no way he was going down that road again. It may have been a couple of quiet weeks, but he was still concerned. He thanked God, Buddha, or whatever higher power had sent her to the Dominican Republic in the first place. Since the divorce, he had been questioning a lot of the beliefs he had taken for granted. He hadn't had the will to pull the trigger on the marriage, but now that he was free, he realized how unhappy he had really been. He also realized that the reasons he stayed for so long were misguided and wrong. He stayed because he was expected to stay. He stayed for his son, Hunter. He stayed because of vows that said for better or for worse, but there was no clause for when it became chronically worse. He had stayed because he had believed in till death do us part. But he was still a young man. He was just turning 51. He still had a lot of life to live, and he wanted to enjoy it. She continued to call and drop by, often bringing bakery treats and Juanita's delicious casseroles. He stayed cordial and pleasant, but tried not to encourage anything. A few weeks after his birthday, she brought a pan of lasagna. That wasn't one of the recipes in Juanita's rotation, so he wondered if she'd been fired. But he didn't want to open a can of worms, so he smiled, accepted the dish, and made a few minutes of polite conversation before gently escorting her out of his apartment after making a tentative date for Hunter to spend the night the next weekend. As he shut and locked the door, he laughed to himself. Don't kid the kidder, he thought. You only let that woman in for the food. Hunter turned the oven onto preheat and then dug around the back of the pantry until he found the decent Chianti. He poured himself a glass and placed the glass dish into the oven to warm up. He used the time for the lasagna to heat up to muse over his situation. The attacks on Karen had stopped once she was firmly out of the picture, and as he feared, his P.I. wasn't able to find anything definitive to show that his ex was behind this. As he expected, the eyewitnesses from the car lot couldn't identify any suspects. Now he just had to find a way to extricate himself from Belle's sights. He knew that if she didn't feel she was making headway soon in whatever game she was playing, she would boil over into a simmering fury. But could he prevent it? Or could he somehow use her rage against her to get her to leave him alone? He sipped the wine and checked the casserole dish. What? No salad or bread, Belle? So uncivilized, he muttered, clicking his tongue in an almost uncanny impersonation as he got a clean plate and some silverware. After taking the dish out of the oven, he cursed softly as he accidentally touched his thumb to the dish as it was cooling. He placed his thumb in his mouth and used his other hand, welding a spatula, to dish up some lasagna. It sure smelled wonderful. If there was an upside to all this drama, it was that he hadn't had to cook very much recently. After he set his plate down on the table, he refilled his wine glass, and he opened his briefcase to review some information for the case tomorrow. He took a small bite of the deliciously garlic-smelling dish. Mmm, this new cook of hers wasn't going to last too long. This lasagna smelled much better than it tasted. 
He did some quick work with some hot sauce and Parmesan cheese, but it still had a strange metallic aftertaste. After a couple bites, he pushed it away. It was disappointingly bad. He decided to dig into the refrigerator for some takeout leftovers. He examined and smelled the carton, but everything smelled fine. He didn't want to wait to heat it up, so he ate a few bites directly from the carton. He stopped after a couple bites because their metallic aftertaste was overpowering everything. He wondered if maybe he was losing a feeling. He decided to take his paperwork to his room and review it from the comfort of his own bed. But first, he went to the bathroom, brushed his teeth, and then opened his mouth wide and looked at his teeth in the mirror. Nothing seemed loose, he thought. Better call the dentist in the morning. But it must be a loose feeling, he thought. My tongue feels a little numb. He climbed into bed, turned on the bedside lamp, grabbed his reading glasses from the side table, and began going over the witness statements again. The defendant sat at the table in a cheap shiny suit with the sheen that was only matched by the gleam of sweat on his forehead. His palms were moist and he tried to wipe them on his pants under the table and out of sight of the jury. Where was his lawyer? After he missed court, the judge sent the bailiff out to the crummy bachelor pad on Sesame Street where Hunter was found dead in his bed, slumped against the headboard with legal papers shattered on the floor beside the bed. Since it was an unexpected, unattended death and a former politician, an autopsy was done. Since there was no obvious evidence of foul play and no visible external injuries, no toxicology samples were taken. The autopsy was performed showing no obvious cause of death. The heart was normal size. Coronary arteries had only minimal placking. There was no inflammation of the liver or other organs. The brain was entirely normal with no evidence of injury, stroke, or hemorrhage. Dr. Jerry Francisco, the medical examiner, could find no reason why the former politician should be dead. Perplexed, he signed out the death certificate as undetermined for manner of death. Despite the autopsy, Hunter Raymond Barron II, the son of modest folk from Pennsylvania, died on a Thursday and was buried by Sunday. Neither Hunter III nor Bell was even mentioned in the obituary. That didn't stop Bell from making it her tragedy. Despite eviscerating Hunter II in the divorce, she attempted to brazen her way forward to liquidate his remaining assets. She was horrified and outraged when the mousy little secretary from Hunter's office came forward with a new will dated to the week their divorce was finalized. She hadn't expected that he would have gotten around to making a new will. The new will left the majority of his assets to the Memphis Legal Aid Society. He left only a watch and cufflinks that had been a law school graduation gift from his uncle. Both were left to his son, Hunter III. Will or no will, divorce or no divorce, Bell quickly adopted the mantle of the grieving widow and tried to obliterate all evidence to the contrary. She dressed in head-to-toe black for the service and gave her best performance to date, crying and tearing at her clothes. As the first handful of dirt was tossed in the grave, she became so weak and unsteady, swaying at the foot of the grave, that several other mourners had to steady her as she swooned dramatically and beautifully. In that moment, the brutal truths of their unhappy marriage and brutal divorce were erased. As a crowd gathered around to comfort poor Mrs. Barron, a young, lovely, 
red-haired court reporter slipped from her chair in the back of the graveside canopy to head back to her newly repainted car, tears staining her cheeks. Later, late in the evening, after her son had gone to bed, Belle crept into his room to adjust his blankets. She found the watch she had given him on his dresser, discarded in favor of the watch from his dad, and she slipped it into the pocket of her robe before creeping back out of his room. The next morning, she snuck back into his room while he was in the shower. She found his watch on the bedside table. She hurriedly grabbed it and took it with her out to the garage. In the garage, still in her bathrobe, she hit the watch repeatedly with an old hammer until nothing remained but fragments of glass, small bits of twisted metal, and the leather band. She scooped all of the pieces up with some newspaper and stashed them in an old coffee can that she placed in the cupboard above the washing machine. That morning, when Hunter came down to breakfast, he asked, Mom, have you seen my watch? No, darling, but you should be more careful about leaving your things around. Maybe if you clean that pig style of a room, you'll find it, she answered. She served him up some pancakes, a rare treat. Afterwards, Hunter went to school and life went on. He never asked her about either watch ever again. This episode was narrated by Zipporah Gray of RMP Studios in Memphis, Tennessee.